So I want so to build the question. Of course, one of the basic things that we then should really have a consensus or, or not is is the question: Is it a problem? So do you think it's it's a problem that women are underrepresented in uh, in finance and economics? So we could maybe start with Vidi. Yeah. Um, so I think it's. Uh, sure, it's a problem that they're underrepresented in finance and economics, but uh, I think it's more really not about, the discussion is really not about uh, discrimination per se. I don't think that's the discussion or that I it's more about the awareness uh, that, you know, uh, and uh, just a bit of self-promotion. We have organized two uh, showcasing women in finance at Miami together with Renee and um Henrik, uh, who's my colleague there at uh, Miami. And, uh, you know, when you talk to some of the people who have come uh, for the conference or the people who attend, uh, a lot of issues come up in discussion. We had a panel like this when you talk about, say, networking, uh, networking at conferences or personal experiences that people have had, uh, where uh, a lot of the audiences respond in that they were not even aware of the issues that exist to begin with. So, sure, underrepresentation is a a problem, but I think even before that, it's just the unawareness uh, that this there is this problem. We don't see enough women in the profession. Uh, there may not be enough networking opportunities as per se. Uh, all of this is kind of precedes uh, this underrepresentation. Finance as a profession is dominated by men. It doesn't make it any better if they only meet uh, white male professors in the classroom. So I also think it's very important for the next generation that there are more women in finance and economics. And can I just add something to that? Yeah, yeah and so uh, um, speaking of gender wage gaps, right? Um, finance is a very high paying profession, right? And so um, if it's only men seeing male role models, then we get this divergence between the wealth of women and the wealth of men, <coughs> right? And then it doesn't seem, well, I guess one has to try and figure out, well, how does one think about these things, right? Mm. So. Um, one thing, I, I mean, I, I don't know about, I totally get the role model effects and the importance of that. Um, I mean, I've, I've been in conversation with, uh, with, uh, with people that care a lot about diversity, but would feel very bad that we um, reduce diversity to uh, having a certain number of women and men in the room. I think, you know, I think they would talk about diversity and I really come to appreciate the way they talk about it in terms of like intellectual diversity. Mm -hmm. And they think that it's really crucial that we will not achieve this intellectual diversity and we will kind of uh, not prosper as a field intellectually if, you know, all of our ideas tend to be very similar because mm -hmm. we are quite, you know, quite homogenous. So it just, I think I li I've, I've grown to like this way of thinking about, you know, the value of diversity. It's not just, you know, about counting, you know, kind of um, men and women. It's really about, you know, the vibrancy of the field and the ideas and the perspectives and, you know, I, I mean, I think it is a fact that I think women tend to work uh, on different kind of questions and, you know, beyond women, I think minorities tend to be interested in different kind of questions and by being so homogenous, I think we are, um, we're not as rich as we could be as, uh, as a discipline. So I totally agree uh, on your point with diversity that gender is just one uh, dimension and there's uh, way more than that. But I have to say, I think that uh, there is already much more uh, diversity in the profession than it was when I entered about 20 years ago. I mean, by then, there was not a single woman that I could think of that was uh, more than 50 in the profession. Now we're a gr growing group. And, and also, even if it changes very slowly, at least I perceive a, a change, which I think is incredibly good. Right. So, yeah, Vassa. Just to say, I mean, the numbers are pretty striking. So a nine to one ratio is, is not random, right? So um, so understanding actually what mm. is it that causes it is, is part of, um, of uh, it's an important part of trying to understand how to, whether to understand whether it's indeed a problem. I mean, it's, it's, it's such a striking number, but um, going back to the sources of what it is. Now, whether it's a problem, I mean, again, it depends what, what one is interested. Is it a social problem? Is it an economic problem? 
Um, I think that's also uh, part of the discussion, but I fully agree that in terms of role models and in general, how rich intellectually the profession can be with different ideas, um, it, it's, it's very important for, for any, any field and, and gender is just one dimension of diversity, so just, just. So, so in your personal view, because you said it depends on how you view the problem, so do you have an opinion about this? How would you, in, in specific, how, to, yeah, how would you formulate so I mean, problem. it could be an, an economic problem if you if you think that, um, which I do think that uh, diversity gives a better outcome. So for a firm, you will have better outcomes for the profession. You'll have ideas that will be richer, uh, emphasizing different dimensions. So yes, that makes it an economic problem. If, if it is a matter of preferences, whatever the source of those preferences might be, it may also make it, um, uh, it may make it a social problem more than an economic problem or or both, so, yeah. Yeah, I, I, yesterday Marianne uh, gave a talk at SNS where she also uh, picked up on the argument that you leave talent on the table if you only, uh, yeah. yeah, if like 50% of the population is not. Just maybe just, uh, you know, the way I, <coughs> I, I, I like to think about the issue is pipeline and, uh, and leaky pipes. Um, and, and, and I think it's clear that we have, I think, a pipeline problem. Um, and um, I think in many ways it's due to a misunderstanding of what, and I, I kind of feel more like an economist than a finance person, so I'll talk more as an, as an economist. I think there's, there's a, I think there's a misunderstanding among, among many undergrads as to what really economics is and the kind of questions, you know, people mm -hmm. study. I think um, too many undergrads would, you know, summarize economics to finance. <laughs> 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 Sorry, you know, even within finance, I mean, I think finance is just richer than just, you know, kind of studying interest rates. Mm -hmm. It's just, um, <laughs> I, I believe so. Um, so I think we, we we have to do better in terms of, you know, explaining, you know, explaining what we do and what we study. Um, but then there's clearly something with the the leaky pipes as well, and and that I think is for me harder to explain and. As I was doing the, the little video thing there, I mean, when I think about, you know, kind of issues of like women's representation in general, I, I tend to think about it in terms of, you know, kind of some occupations are just going to be more difficult for women than others uh, because of, you know, kind of the, the schedule and travel and all of that. But, you know, I think the, the kind of facts that, uh, that Renee mentioned, um, you know, suggest to me that it's something else that's going on because you know, how come uh, all the fields, you know, of academia, you know, succeeding at a much faster rate than, than we are. So there's something that I, we don't fully understand that, you know, kind of um, makes economics and finance particularly difficult once you have a PhD in terms of, you know, in terms of succeeding. But isn't it a fact that there's been much less emphasis on, for example, gender diversity in economics and finance compared to the STEM fields? So, so it could be. I'm thinking partly the awareness, which uh, I mean, effect and and, uh, and the equivalent in the econ profession is trying to build, uh, just by putting focus on it. Possibly, <coughs> which is true. But then um, I think CSWEP sort of makes this point that uh, you know they were founded in 1971, and then the graph still you know the lines are flat. Mm essentially. True, but if you look at political uh, emphasis, I mean, uh, in the news, broadly in society, I've heard way more about the issue in STEM, in science, in math yeah, and engineering. Yeah. I don't really hear the politicians talking about uh, economics. So, no. so I'm thinking, yeah, maybe the organization was there, but perhaps not the awareness more broadly. And I think CSWEP, you know, and I think CSWEP would say that, yeah, they've been in existence since 1970, but they're kind of not mainstream. I mean, I think mm -hmm. they still feel like they are this, you know, organization on the <laughs> side of like the American Economic Association, but maybe their mission is not being fully embraced by, you know, the AEA leadership as much as it ought to be. If, you know, the AEA, mm -hmm. you know, and just I know more about the AEA than what's happening in Europe, but was truly concerned about raising awareness about issues of diversity. Yeah. So to the point that we're not really talking about it. So one of the things that I find really striking is that the demand now that we have to hire more women seems to come from the top of the organization. So for example, in my department, we have now been told that going on the job market, one position is earmarked for a woman. That doesn't come from the department. That comes from the top guys. And I'm hearing similar stories 
uh, from, 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 from others. And, and I just find it very, very interesting that it's not in the departments that the drive is originating. So that's worth thinking about why that is. Mm. In, fa in fact, I mean, we do observe that it often comes from the top and departments get pressure to sort of rebalance their, their, their um, um, gender uh, balance within the department. But often I, I, I see discussions that often is resented by departments um, this and I'm not completely sure it, it actually leads to a good outcome at the end because, you know, at the end the hiring is a big part of that uh, process takes place at the department level and then, um, yeah. But the question is how do you change if there isn't uh, pressure? So um, when I moved to Norway 10 years ago, I was uh, at the outset very negative to this board gender quota that they had there, with the which requires about 40% uh, women on corporate boards. Uh, and then having lived there and experienced it, I'm thinking it, you actually force change. I mean, the board is different because it's a team with different skills, so it might be easier to rebalance. But, uh, but sometimes I also think that pressure is important to, to achieve a change. Right. Um, just going back to the question about why do you see more STEM women in STEM and uh, not so much in economics and finance? Uh, when you talk to, like I've talked to colleagues who are biologists, etc., and mm. Uh, for example, you can go to a conference in biology and you can tie your kid to your back and you can go. Uh, but we never see that happen in economics and finance, you know. So it's almost uh, economics and finance doesn't seem to be as family friendly as some of the other STEM disciplines are. Because a lot of my friends who were assistant professors would just take their kids along and go to the conferences. Uh, somehow that has never, whether it's just the way the norm is, it hasn't happened in economics and finance. And from my own personal experience, I can say that uh, when my two kids came along and they were two below two, I just couldn't travel. Mm -hmm. uh, it was just impossible for me to go to a conference because they were, or take them for that matter, because it's not the norm anymore. It's not the norm. Um, right. But you know, STEM fields have made that, you know, there are more women, uh, they just, you know, they figured a way out how to manage with it. Yeah. Could I just um, add a more cynical view on <laughs> why economics and finance is worse than um, other fields? And I think it's part of it is because of the, um, there's, you know, economists believe in markets, <laughs> right? <laughs> and mm. so, you know, you observe an equilibrium and you say, well, the market is efficient, right? So it must be the case that whatever we observe is actually the right outcome of some market equilibrium, right? And so, um, which then means, um, and you get this a lot, and I get this a lot because I actually work in the area of gender, so you should see some of my referee reports, <laughs> very interesting, um, <coughs> uh, is, uh, so people say, well, if the women are not there, so it's always the women's fault, right? Because markets work, right? So if the women are not there, it must be because the women, A, don't want to be there, or B, are not good enough to be there. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I think th this, perception is very difficult to change, right? But I think it's there because, I mean, okay, so let me just illustrate an example. <laughs> so, I, so I have a paper about um, uh, um, female artists. Okay, so it turns out that in the auction market, uh, art painted by women uh, is sold at a, a big discount relative to art painted by men. Okay, and we, we go through, we look at all the explanations or whatever, and we send the paper out for comments, and the first reaction that people say is it must be that the women are worse, that the women cannot paint as well as the men. But so, th so the difference between the economists and the other STEM fields is the STEM field, like in biology, they don't think that women are genetically inferior to men. <laughs> <laughs> but the economists will think that the woman is genetically inferior to, to men, right? Because markets, it's this belief in markets that they work, right? <laughs> so, so I think that's actually a problem with our profession. Um, and then these things like norms, you know, it's like, how do they arise? Well, it's because why do we need, the market works, right? So why do we need to do these things? Um, so, I, yeah, maybe I'm a bit cynical about our field, but. Uh, I like it. Uh, no, I mean, it's interesting to hear, hear your view. So I wanted to involve the audience a little bit. So I know that it's not only <laughs> academics here. So I really wonder if, if you hear this from the academic field, do you feel, does anybody want to respond and uh, say that, 
there seems to be something completely different going on in academics versus uh, the private sector. And it, there is also underrepresentation of women there, of course. So maybe state your name as well. Well, I'm Anne Dahlgren. I'm not an academic. I'm from the business side. And I think first I would like to thank the, you know, the, the group for having this, uh, this occasion to invite us as well. Because I think collaboration is, is the best in terms of like promoting and you know, contaminating the, the whole society. So first, a comment. I believe a lot on diversity, and especially uh, you know, gender diversity. It's part of the whole spectrum. I think part of the whole sustainable business model or society models. So diversity is in the context of promoting a sustainable uh, society and a sustainable business model. And I do believe that in the finance side, not just on the academic side, but also on the business side, we see the same thing. It's the same pattern. And I think that somehow, you know, as what you mentioned in finance, you deal a lot with numbers. You deal a lot with, you know, like the markets and everything. And one thing that I somehow lack, I'm, as I said, I'm not uh, an academic, but I'm a strong believer of diversity, is a research is li really linking the effect of gender diversity to the, you know, to the profitability, to the shareholder's value. Because if I go back to my company and said, okay, I spent time here, you know, like this uh, about the diversity and gender diversity. I mean, my company is paying me to stay here. So it's more of like bringing that, that, uh, that benefit to the company that I, ca I come back to you bringing a benefit. Because I referred to the, you know, to the first research presented this morning that somehow in, in Denmark you had this uh, law uh, that changed you know, the disclosure and everything. But one of the, if the, if the research result shows that there's no effect on the profitability, then what is the case for gender diversity? for a business? And why will a business finance activities on gender diversity if I, c if I cannot provide the profitability? So I think what's very critical is really to show what is the, you know, the real effect on the profitability from a gender diversity perspective. Can I just, just say something in response to this? So I, I s so much agree with this, and you know, kind of when you reflect on the research on the value of diversity, I think there's no good research on you know on the value of diversity, and I think you know so there's all the stuff, the, all the correlations that you know kind of companies are using. Um, I think if there was more robust research on that, that would be I think really useful to uh, to the conversation. And I'm you know I kind of know that you know I think we all know that there's some limits on how much diversity is gonna help, right? Mm -hmm. So the extreme examples where we are so diverse that we don't understand each other's <laughs> language, you know, we're not gonna be a good company and we're not gonna perform. So, so it cannot be just like a theorem that more diversity is always better, but I think we, we need more robust research document, you know, kind of what, what, what the benefits are. I mean, there are some numbers out there showing a positive correlation between female leadership, between uh, boards with lots of women and profitability, sales growth, ESG, etc. The thing is that we, it's very tricky to say anything about causality and studies that have shown haven't really uh, been able to show any causality. So it could be that profitable businesses uh, attract women, more women, or that they allow for more women to be appointed, but to claim that because we have more gender diversity, we're going to increase corporate profits, I think that's going to be a long shot. You need to believe in diversity for a broader set of issues, I think, to fight this battle. And, and in my mind, when you think about recruiting talent, where do young people want to work, etc. I think diversity is important. It's going to be important for the future, but I don't think that it's going to be the profit argument directly uh, that makes it. And if you look at, at the research that looks at teams, some tasks, uh, very homogenous teams are actually better at performing. They can carry them out quicker with less discussion, with less conflict. So, so it's, uh, it's uh, too hard to say in general that diversity always rules. So, so again, I think you need to believe in it for, for a range of reasons, and including that it's just much more fun to work in a diverse organization than a very homogenous one. 
Yes, I can. Can I add something to that? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I also want to give the word <coughs> to some man in the <laughs> audience. Uh, no. But <laughs> uh, Rene, you talk. Yeah, well you talk first. All right. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. <coughs> yeah, so I totally agree with um, we need more research. Mm -hmm. And I think one, one thing that people really miss is, so there's a lot of conflicting evidence on the business case, right? So <coughs> I actually have a paper that shows that there's a negative relationship be between board diversity and firm performance. And some people view that as extremely negative. Like, how could I possibly go out and say that diversity might decrease value? But I think the problem is, is that people don't ask why, right? So I mean... I don't think anyone, well, maybe some people really do because they're like these extreme economists, right? But, um, but some b it's not like we really believe that people are inferior. And can you really think that diversity per se is really bad? I mean, I don't think that one reasonable people would think that. And so the question is, if you don't find it in performance, why is that the case? And I think that's really where the research needs to focus is to try and figure out what is actually going on with diversity. Okay, but this will take a while, right? It's very hard. These are very complicated problems. It will take a while to get there. And so I think the, the key thing is that in the short run, you can't ask for the profitability motive to do the right thing, right? I mean, you just have to believe that diversity is good and then you do it. And then in the long run, you expect the benefits to pay off. I mean, it's like, like with every corporate decision, do you know for sure mm -hmm. that like doing an acquisition, is that going to add shareholder value? Well, I mean, come on, there's tons of literature showing that it's bad to do an acquisition, but do people still do it? Yes, they do, right? So with any corporate decision, people still do it, even though there's no evidence that it adds value. So why with diversity is it any different? <laughs> <laughs> right? I mean. Okay, so is there any man who wants to respond to <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> in the audience? No, I mean, basically to this question, maybe I can make it more explicit. So I I if you as a man, how do you view the benefit of having more female colleagues uh, in your profession. Um, <laughs> 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 How about the disadvantages? Being a female colleague. <laughs> <laughs> You're allowed to cold call. <laughs> exactly. No. Okay. No, but uh, I mean, we can move on. So, so another issue uh, that I want to bring uh, bring up is that I think there might be a generational difference, and uh, not so much in age, but also between the, the insiders versus the outsiders, no? So the ones that are successful that are typically on stage, uh, so they might already have a, a, s a selective view on, on this whole discussion versus uh, assistant professors who are still aspiring to become a professor. So I was wondering uh, if one of the assistant professors has, has a comment on, on how you view this explicit promotion, how that impacts uh, the environment for women, but also for males. Uh. Um, so I was in the market this year, and I heard a lot of those things. So it would be easy for you, right? You're female. <laughs> and um, of course, it uh, with, all the, with all the kind of challenges of establishing my name, I think it's, uh, it puts, it makes, it opens a gate for an easy argument why um, kind of why why my struggles can be discarded, why why it's easy to poke at me, why it's easy to attack me with these arguments that you only get this position because you're a woman, mm -hmm. and I think it took me some time to to kind of build the defense and build the build the courage to say yes, it's because I'm a woman. I have to work twice as hard to get anywhere, <laughs> and <laughs> that's how I typically answer it these days. Um, if they say, is it? Is it the case that I got my position because I'm a woman? Yes, because I observe, I work hard, I persevere. And that's the kind of the qualities that I think being a woman in finance, you have to, you have, to have. And I think that's what is building. Yeah. Sorry, you're saying it's proactive. Do you think that's scaring you? Half jokingly, half jokingly. <laughs> yeah, I think it's no one would ever explicitly accuse me of anything. But I think that's kind of the... the, 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 yeah. the the, the, the way, uh, and it comes back to the culture, right? I think it's important, like, mm. why I think it we are as econ economics and finance are doing a bit worse. And I think it's, what I noticed is that a lot of the culture of giving feedback, for example, right? Mm. When you present in a school where the culture is kind of like very aggressive and giving feedback, what I noticed is that a lot of male colleagues go afterwards for beers, and that's when the mending happens when they would say, they would get a pat on the shoulder and would say, okay, you're doing fine. Mm -hmm. The senior colleagues would do that to junior men. But I, 
rarely see that the junior female colleagues would get a pat on the shoulder mm. saying you're doing fine or ever actually invited for beers afterwards, right? After the seminar. It's kind of like, okay, it's a taboo mm -hmm. in, in, in sense to, I see less of social interaction between senior colleagues, which happen to be mostly men, and junior female colleagues uh, for that mending, for that, like you, you received harsh feedback to your talk, but you need some, some, some kind of, kind of support as well. And I think we get all the harsh, harsh <laughs> comments, <laughs> but not demanding over the beers. I mean, that, that's my impression at least. So, so let me just say in the past, I mean, you say that they say maybe you got the position because you're a woman. The truth is that in the past you would have not gotten that position because you're a woman. Uh, so, I mean, uh, just to piggyback on the same thing, uh, I've heard the same kind of comment because I'm still an associate professor and I want to go up for full. And the thing that I kind of hear, thing is, oh, it's going to be easy for you because they want more full professors who are women. Uh, but it's never, you know, they don't go to the next step, okay, have you seen my CV? So I've, I've seen that at many levels, not just at the assistant professor level, but at every level you, you always, ex you know, mm -hmm. half jokingly or even half seriously, I've heard these comments uh, that have come my way. And uh, regarding the networking, um, uh, I'll tell you an, uh, an anecdote that Ingrid Werner, whose uh, faculty at Ohio State had told us at Showcasing Women in Finance last year at Miami. Uh, so there's a very uh, niche conference in finance, which is the Utah Ski Conference. And the traditionally, what would happen is after the conference, all, people, all the people, or particularly all the men, would jump into the hot tub. And she did not want to <laughs> jump into the hot tub <laughs> with all these. And she said that was a place that, you know, people, uh, you know, network, maybe start projects or whatever. And she said, I didn't <laughs> want to ever jump into that hot tub. <laughs> and because of that, did, did I lose out on some opportunities? And I've kind of heard these kind of anecdotes, going for beer, you know, th activities that may not always be, you know, I mean, I don't want to go out. After school, I have to go home because I have to pick up two kids, so I, I can't go for a beer, uh, or I have other constraints. So I think those are real problems because you can't network enough or maybe get the pat on the back or whatever else that you are uh, looking for. But I have to say, I've been a participant at the Utah <laughs> Ski Conference since the mid-90s, and I've been in many hot tubs. <laughs> <But> <laughs> and full <laughs> professor. <laughs> I can tell you, <laughs> <laughs> I think maybe we mystify what's going on in the hot tub. <laughs> so. okay. I don't think you missed out on that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but, but so what I really want, so I promised uh, our department head that in the end so of this whole uh, panel, we actually come to some conclusions in the sense that so we want to hear some uh, best practices or some advice. So, I mean, I, I, I think it, it's also good to hear more anecdotes about everything that, that's wrong, no, and, and, and see how, if we believe there's not explicit, really, discrimination, which I think, I mean, it's still there, but it might not be the, the driving force against uh, promotion of women. But I think so. So it's good to establish like what are the implicit um, driving forces that hold women back, and then think about okay. So what would we then recommend as best practices and yeah, advice for the future, basically? And so, Pelle Stormer wants to say something. So maybe uh, it'd be interesting to hear uh, your thoughts on best practices in the particular uh, the particular. Uh, uh, particularly with respect to promotions, okay? Because um, as Marianne's work has shown, you know, it's not just about the hiring stage, but it's about the glass ceiling. Uh, it's pretty clear from the statistics that there's a pretty big glass ceiling in economics uh, and finance. Um, and, you know, we try to be, or, you know, research-oriented department try to be objective. We look at data, you know, we have the same clock for everyone. We count articles, citations, da da da. It seems, though, that we are missing out, and people realize that, that typically when you have a child, that is much more tolling for the woman than, uh, than for the man. And then departments try to make out, oh, you get another year if you have a kid, but you know, if we only give it to the women, it's unfair, so we give it to all the 
uh, guys as well. And then all these male assistant professors at Wharton, they have tons of kids and <laughs> ten year <laughs> clocks. <laughs> yeah. Um, and they don't have to take care of the kids. Uh, so how do you? Um, I mean, how should one deal with uh, with uh, this? Uh, and I think it's actually. I mean, I'm not gonna. Uh, talk too long, but I mean, there, there are interesting things with these measures. So, okay, so we look at citations, for example, but I think there might well be a citation bias, uh, because women might work on different problems than men, and there are more men in the profession, so they tend to cite people doing the work that they work on, and so mm -hmm. on. So, I mean, it'd be interesting to hear some uh, thoughts about what to do about this. So I think you're asking very good questions, and uh, I have no good answer. But I'd like to say, as a senior uh, in my department, uh, the so the school has a lot of measures to promote women. For example, if we hire a junior woman, we get 1.2 positions. It means that we can um, hire like a visitor or someone teaching a course, a research mentor, something extra. Uh, so they become associate professors, they get their first sabbatical after two years, men get it after six years. Uh, so and, and the idea is to, um, to help women to get the, the publications that they need to be promoted to full. Um, and there's actually more research money for women centrally. Then, as a senior person in my department, I feel I cannot be a role model yet women I need to mentor the young men too and I feel bad for them that they get worse conditions actually so what happens I see that often the department makes up for the difference in, in research budget it's really in some ways just different aspects of what you're talking about how can we make it equal um, and and of course we want everyone to have the same uh, conditions and, and uh, possibilities opportunities to succeed uh, but I think awareness is the only thing that can um, that can help to be uh, to to try to to look at yourself. I mean, when we hire, I always think: Do I judge this candidate harsher because she's a woman? Do I have different expectations? And and uh, I think we all have these implicit biases that we aren't aware of. But the more we talk about them, the more we're able to deal with them. I hope at least. Um. Okay, sorry. Yeah, um, so in my experience, I think the, um, the biggest hindrance uh, for women is this networking thing. Mm. So, so I, I don't really know how to characterize it, but I think it's about women communicate and they interact differently than men do. So if you're in a workplace where there's a majority of men and there's very few women, or the other way around for that sake, uh, it's sort of very easy to to sort of fall onto the periphery of the interaction. Uh, so it may be about being invited for beer, but, but I, I, I think it's, it's much more than that. Uh, and then if, if, if in addition you have a family and you don't have time to hang around around the coffee machine, you have to just work harder to be part of the conversation. And that means that you are not in the network. You don't get as much information. You don't get access to the same opportunities and that kind of thing. And I can't really see any way to improve that situation other than to increase the mass of women in the departments or in the institution. Um, I think there's no way around that. And there may be some short-run costs that th it generates resentment and unfairness. Um, but I think I to, to reap the long-term gains, I think that mass has to increase. And, and I simply don't see any way around it than being very conscious about wanting to increase it. How many um, so we are two now. We are we are now a large department. We are over twenty people. I'm, <laughs> for a long time, I was the only woman. Um, now we have um, we're two. So we're, we I think at no point have we been more than than two active research, uh, female researchers. So it's it's a little lonely sometimes, <laughs> definitely. I um I mean I think you y your question is is exactly on target. <coughs> um, I don't have. I don't have a good answer to it. Um, I'm, I'm certainly hearing the argument that, that you made, I think both of you made, that you know ultimately we need to have some dose of, of affirmative action so that we reach the point where um, there's, there's more of a mass and a lot of the issues that you, know, that you are highlighting 
um, gets gets sold by this, you know, higher, you know, kind of a higher mass of woman. I, I, um, I, I w worry about this transitional cost, you know, a lot. I mean, I heard the stories. I mean, these are not great stories to hear. These are not great stories to hear when you are an assistant professor, where you feel like, well, you got the job because they want women, or you're going to get your full professorship because they want women. It's, it's not, it's not great. So. Um, I worry a bit about, you know, kind of how long these transitional costs uh, uh, are going to be. I, I think less, you know, I think less aggressive, uh, I think fairly low cost is, you know, I think departments can probably do a better job in terms of simple debiasing type strategies. So I don't know how good departments are in terms of, uh, having in place, you know, we know the kind of, you know, implicit biases that, you know, people fall for. We know that there are ways to reduce this bias. So, you know, kind of, you know, just saying, you know, we're not going to make an offer because we don't like, we don't like what she's doing. You know, we, we can't, we can't have that. So I don't know how many departments are like that where we just, you know, you can say no to somebody and your explanation can simply be, well, I just don't like the work. I think forcing people to explain and articulate why, you know, they don't like something and explain to somebody else and defend it is useful. And I think we should be much more systematic when we make, you know, junior hiring decision, promotion decision in, you know, kind of forcing these, uh, these explanations. We should justify our choices. So I think there's a lot of, you know, I think that has been learned in terms of, you know, implicit biases and how to de-bias in psychology. And I think the minimum we should do, for sure, that I have no doubt, is make sure that, you know, every school has in place, you know, is frontier in terms of, having those mechanisms, uh, you know, to, to de-bias in place. Uh, on the point of the, you know, um, more affirmative action, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I really just can't make up my mind. I mean, I certainly have been sitting in, you know, in promotion committees where, you know, I've heard this, she's not as good, but, you know, it's okay. She's a woman. It's, it doesn't feel good. It just doesn't feel good. And I don't think it's good for, I don't think it's good for a field, but maybe you guys are right. Maybe this is a transitional cost we, you know, we have to pay. Um, I think in terms of best practices, one thing that I <coughs> saw last year was uh, in finance, one of the big conferences, the Western Finance Association. And this time in the email that came around, Affect has a list of all finance female faculty. And they just said, if you're looking for discussants and people to chair the sessions, you can go to this list as well. And I don't think it was a coincidence that I got a chance to do a discussion right after that you know, because I think most people here, at least finance, female academics are on that website. So I think that, in a sense, is a be best practice thing. You're not forcing people to actually take female, peop you know, faculty as discussants. Of course, you're going to match the right paper or the right fit, but it's just the uh, you know that you have this list. You go see you this person is not your co-author or in your network, but you know is a good fit for this paper to be discussed. Um, so I think that that is a, a, a I, that was a great thing that the WFA did this year. Just a quick comment. I think that is awareness. I mean, yes. uh, so we arrange a, a conference every year at my school. And the first year, I didn't think about it, but we had uh, only men on the program. And I was asked about it. But I think now I really try to make sure that it's diverse. And once you start looking, they're very competent women, yeah. too. The problem is if you don't start looking, you just think you about... You don't find. No. You don't look enough. So yeah. awareness is super important. Hello, I'm Nadine Verma. I'm from the private sector. I've been in finance for 30 years. Uh, but my good example is not from finance. It's from, from uh, consulting and actually from uh, Accenture because they, they are also struggling with, with this promotion line. They have 50% women entering and then they have 10% <laughs> coming to the top. And, and, and in Sweden, they have actually uh, try to analyze why this is the case. So they were, uh, I would say, so strong that they, they decided to take in external observers to, ev well, not maybe every meeting, many we meetings. They are also, with being an American company, they, they're, uh, uh, they are evaluated on quarterly basis. So they had external observers looking at these evaluation uh, discussions. Uh, general meetings where they were discussing to try to see the unconsciousness 
uh, what was happening in the organization. Well, f the outcome, for example, was that uh, the CEO of the Swedish company, he never went out for lunch with female colleagues. And he didn't reflect about it, and, I and he had some reasons for not doing it, because being perceived as a man going with a woman, what would that say? But after he started to think about his why could I not go to, uh, for lunch with a woman, or many women for that sake, and, and really they, they nailed down to see where in their processes they made things that unconsciously made them uh, promote men and not promote women. So, but that's a very uh, good step to take and difficult and you, want you have to have a CEO that really wants to dig down into details because otherwise, but yeah. I think that's a very, very good example of when you want to do things, I don't know the outcome after this, but they at least try to identify really the unconscious uh, thing that we do that we don't think uh, that we do. Okay. So I think also um, <coughs> having some introspection is very valuable. And I don't see many departments doing that, where you sit down and you say, well, what kind of department do we want to be? And how do we achieve it? I don't think, I don't see many conversations around this, but I, I think it's really essential to, to have a conversation. And, and getting back to the measurement issue, <coughs> in our research, you know, we try very hard to try to say, oh, let's rule out unobserved ability and all these things. And we know how hard it is to measure these things. But when it comes to academic merit, all we do is we count numbers. Yeah. And, and boy, it drives me crazy. I'm like, we are scientists when we talk about firms, but we are unscientific when we talk about ourselves. Because we know it, and nobody reads the papers, right? And nobody says, well, maybe they're looking at something interesting from a different perspective. And OK, so, um, so there's now evidence that maybe there's a publication bias. The citation thing, you know, you are not cited if you're not invited to seminars, right? So if you look at university, seminar speaker lists, they're male dominated, right? Because, and it's natural because you invite people you know. And so if you're the people who go out for beers, it's like, oh, I'm gonna invite you for a seminar, right? If you don't go out for beers, people don't know you, and then they don't invite you for a seminar, then you don't get cited, right? So if you're gonna count just these measures, then we have a problem, right? So I think one has to think about measurement, scientifically, right? And also, um, you know, sort of about where we want to be. And uh, I think having some introspection would be very useful. Hi, na hi, my name is Vivika Hirdman. I'm also from the private sector. I have a question to you because what we would do, we would look at best practice in the private sector. And, and of course, this has been an ongoing discussion for decades also in the private sector, but I think we are ahead of you, really, nowadays. Uh, and why, in your research, have you looked at the faculties or the universities, universities that are doing well? Uh, wh are there any top faculties where you have a more balanced uh, 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 number of women on the faculty. Uh, what are they doing? What can you learn from them? What, th what have been their key success factors? Uh, or is it just, you know, lousy numbers all over? I'm afraid it's... Uh. <laughs> yeah. It's it's uh, <laughs> I, I'm afraid it's pretty much lousy, lousy numbers, numbers all over. All over. So I, I mean, I think like mm -hmm. Ohio State, maybe they have four women, but out of what? Yeah, 25, no, it's 30, lousy numbers so. all over. Yeah. <coughs> but if, you know, I mean, I don't know what they are. I mean, so so I, I, I'm, I'm closely involved with some a, uh, attempt to try to understand what's going on in economics and, and the climate. So uh, I think there are, there are some universities that are really just going and, you know, implementing some of the psychological research that has been, you know, kind of guiding our understanding of bias and how to de-bias and really developing programs about, you know, how they are, how they are doing it. So, yes, I think in there are some schools. Yeah. Or university in, level. in economics department. Oh yeah? yeah. So there's some schools that do things better uh, than others, you know, and then we have to think about ways to try to kind of make sure that these best practices get, you know, get communicated and get adopted by, you know, by other places. I think, you know, that I wasn't part of this thing, but I heard last year at the, at the AA meetings, there was an event where, you know, kind of one of these schools that has developed these best practices explained what they were doing, but no one was there. <laughs> uh, you know, you can put stuff on, you know, C-SWEP, you know, 
uh, you know, I'm, sh I'm sure the people from this would say, look, we have all this material on our web page that we have developed that's informed by these best practices. The Fed is supposed to be frontier in terms of the development of best practices for recruiting. And, you know, no one picks this up because, you know, it's just on web pages. So I think there's a real issue about, you know, adoption uh, beyond just uh, my sense is that there's there's things out there that are better than what the model school is doing. I mm -hmm. think the big problem is how you get to the adoption stage, what kind of nudges, what kind of incentives you put in place to, you know, to get uh, to get places to adopt. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so we've done some of that. So we, um, but it's sort of funny because you said that the adoption thing is an issue. So, so we put together a list of best practices and we're sort of adding to it. Um, but the um, getting the word out is difficult. Um, and so that's something that we, we struggle with. So it, yeah, I think. Yeah, <coughs> but you know, it's, it's interesting. Yeah, but um, so personally, I find um, doing what I do very costly. So like running effect, I found to be a very costly thing for me personally. Um, <coughs> and so I, I, I constantly think about, well, how much do I want to push this? Right, because I suffer a lot. So first, I, I spend a lot of my research time doing this. And as a result, I don't have as many numbers as some people do. And this thing about, um, so I was also recently looking for a job. Thank God I found one. But it took me a long time to find a job. And you know why? Because a lot of people were counting how many numbers of publications I had. And I said, well, but <coughs> you know, you understand. Like, I never got the, to the place where I could say, well, but do you understand that I'm doing all this other stuff? Like, like doing this department survey, I put it up. It's one slide. It looks very simple, right? This is a lot of work. It's a lot of work that I could have spent writing a paper, right? Um, and so I find it personally very costly. And then the, the question is, how does one coordinate a shame mechanism? There's a lot of backlash, right? I feel personally that um, I've suffered because people think I'm some horrible feminist that's making them feel <laughs> uncomfortable, right? People don't like these conversations and people say, oh, you know. And then the worst thing is I also do research on gender. And so then it's like I walk into a room, I want to present a paper and people think that they know what I'm going to say because, oh, that's that feminist woman Right, and then, you know, so so like, so the I, I agree with you, but finding the right avenue is not so easy. Just the short comment. I think Vivica kind of answered it. I think the the people who you need to get these practices, best practices out to, is not us or you know economists or even department heads. It's deans because that's where the pressure is coming from. I think our dean and our leadership here at DSSC would benefit greatly from having a list of best practices and they can then force, you know, on, on the departments. But a reflection is, so in my department we're four women, that's high for finance, four out of 19, so that's like, I don't know, 15%. Uh, but when we recruit, I mean, um, everyone would like better gender balance, but uh, in, in today's market, um, there is a lot of pressure generally for departments to hire women. I think uh, most schools is, is putting pressure on, on the departments and perhaps give more slots if they hire women. But uh, there isn't that great of a number too. So 
I would say when when we give offers, often the women they get they get competing offers too. So so it's not just to change as well. And and uh, um, I feel it's uh, it, I I don't think it's not only men that that do this either. I mean it's it's all of us. It's the structure. Perhaps it uh, attracts fewer women because it's so male dominated, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But it's it's very tricky. Yes, I, I just had a, a comment because I want to, to both uh, getting back to this with, with the dean. Of course, that could affect well, whether you have to or not. But as you talked about, it's a lot about the pipeline and judgment, uh, what's going on. And I think there are other, also other places to learn from. Uh, now we're talking about homosexual reproduction, but you also have studies, for instance, of class reproduction. There's this very interesting book by Lauren Rivera. Um, uh, about that called pedigree, how come uh, classes reproduced in, in the US are the top schools, top consulting firms, top law firms and so on. And one and she's been looking into what's actually going on when they hire people and how is this process organized. And I think in terms of looking at tenure and promotion to professor, there are some interesting findings and that is to do with when does bias kick in. And this is not like a sociolo this is more like a sociologist study, not psychology. How does it work? And it's not, you know, the the bad guys, the women, or the top ones, it's, you know, on the level, well, we hired her because she was a woman, or maybe that kicked in. So actually, this could have been somebody who was okay, was actually quite good. But the idea, for instance, that women are bad with numbers, or black guys are aggressive, according to her study, that kicks in precisely when you said, okay, so is this going in or going out? Is this good or not? So I think also, when does bias kick in and how? Uh, and the other comment, um, like to have is that we always seem to forget about uh, affirmative action that's already there. And that goes back to this argument, there's this perfect market, or I'm in a different field, but you still have the idea that, well, we have a meritocracy. Yeah, but maybe meritocracy is not where we start out. Maybe there is already affirmative action. Maybe there is a reason, like in this place we're now at the SSC, there's so many men around, we talked about that during the break among the students and in the faculty, and it's been like that for 100 years. It's not like that at other schools. Where is that? Well, maybe we're more meritocratic, so all the top guys stay here, or maybe there's something else going on. So I think there's, like you said, you were hired because you were a woman. <laughs> yeah, and I think maybe you, you probably are because you have to work twice as hard, and we also have problems in, in Swedish business. I think that's also interesting. In a country like Sweden, we still have problems for women to reach the very top. So I think there is a lot to learn also looking at what's going on right now and is it really meritocratic? Do we have affirmative action already and for whom? Does any of you wish to respond? <laughs> so if I understood your question uh, right, is that you mean the fact that we have so many men is because we were promoting men before? But this is where awareness comes in, and EFFECT has had an impact, I think, by uh, exposing women in a positive way as, and, and creating an awareness about how male-dominated uh, conference programs typically are. So, uh, so I think that's, that's super important, and as you say, in some way, maybe that was a, a discrimination before, uh, but awareness can help to some extent, at least. But so, Renee, I remember that you tried to introduce in uh, Australia a blind um, hiring process. Yeah. So, so um, I don't know if you guys are aware, there's this uh, blind orchestra audition mm -hmm. study. And so we tried to do um, uh, a blind recruiting process, which I think is actually the right way to do it. And so basically what we do is um, it, it, it involves some effort, which is why not 
many departments might do it, but, but basically uh, people submit their papers. So if, you're, if you get hired for an assistant professor job, basically you submit your job market paper for the people who are uh, not academics. So you have a piece of research. And the way that it normally it works is um, the committee that evaluates uh, the, the positions or the candidate says, okay, well, here's uh, the paper, it has the name and the institution, um, here's the CV, and here are the letters of recommendation. And then we look at everyone, and then we decide who we're going to invite for interviews. Okay. Um, and so what we did is we um, stripped the name, the institution, off the paper, uh, we stripped the CV, and we stripped the recommendations. So the only thing I that is there is the paper. Okay, and then everyone has to read the paper, and they have to say paper good, paper bad. You know, should we invite them? And then you go and look at the CV and the recommendations. Okay, so um, and what it did is it shifted the equilibrium. So um, uh, you know, I, I I was sort of like, well, we should really do a study on this, but we didn't do it, and you know, it was very time consuming, obviously, to do this. But um, but it did shift the equilibrium because we were in a very bad equilibrium where we were only inviting people to interview who already had publications. And this gets to the measurement issue, where the only thing that people do is they count and they don't read. Okay, but the only thing that should count is the paper, because it's, it's the ideas that matter, not the line items on the CV. And so we shifted the equilibrium from only inviting people who had um, publications on their CV, who ended up just being the worst presenters, and like people who had no ideas whatsoever, and the only reason they had publications is because they were data slaves to some senior professor. Okay, and so we had all these people coming through. They were like the people you don't want to hire. And then we shifted the equilibrium to people who actually had good ideas. And so this was very useful. And so I'm not sure that we necessarily got more women candidates or whatever, but we got much better candidates. Um, and so I think this blind recruiting is one thing that one could do uh, just for the profession as a whole, right? Mm -hmm. I think it's very useful. Um, so yeah, so that was... Yeah, and that addresses a little bit of your question where we might have a bias on pedigree. So you only look at CVs that come from a certain uh, university. See, though, how this could very much backfire if, you know, schools have a desire to try to recruit more women. Yeah, well, so this was the first stage, yeah. right? And then, um, and then the second stage is you can bring in all the other stuff. Right, so it's not like, so, but then, but then it's very hard, it's harder to make the argument that you were going to, so, so like, and I think this comes in a lot, is people from lower schools are systematically sort of discriminated against, right? It's harder to make the argument that you're not going to invite them to the interview if two people said they like the paper, right? You can still say, well, we're not going to invite them to the interview because we really want someone who's better trained and we know we're going to get that from a top school, but it's a little bit harder. And so, yeah, so you can still say, well, you know, the women, the, nobody liked the women's papers. Okay, fine, but then you can make, still make the argument that, well, maybe we should invite some women because, you know, yeah, yeah so. so it could backfire in some sense, but I think it's, yeah. yeah. Mm. Oh, yeah, well, just a short comment. I guess a lot of people, um, use like econ job market and these for managing you know the submissions of who is looking for jobs and I guess an having an anonymous submission of your job market paper there could sort of easily be implemented it's just a sort of you know you're talking about how costly this is in terms of just managing the whole thing but mm -hmm. that could be you know done centrally for the whole market at once right if you well no the the, the cost is in reading the paper you need to read the paper of course yeah yeah so, so you don't so you don't read the papers. <laughs> we read the papers. <laughs> but I would say all papers. Not yeah. trusting what you know the placement officers at school is telling you as to who you should be looking at, which I think is an important question because in many we've been wondering this question. We rely a lot on placement officers that tell us these are the people we should be looking at. No, you know, we've been questioning, should we be doing that? But as, you know, as Renee described, it's, 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 a, big, it's a big cost. Um, yeah. So recruiting is one issue. Another one is, of course, how do you do once you get your first position? And, for example, in Norway, they recently have shown that uh, men uh, get a much higher fraction of the research grants. It's much harder to get a research grant as a woman. So, of course, it's, it, it's uh, the, the continued progress as well because we have this leaking pipeline. It's not only at the assistant professor level. I mean, it goes all the way. And there are lots of, of, of reasons for this leaking pipeline, I think. Right. 
Okay, so so we're nearing the end of the panel. So um, to come back to the original question, so so what I would conclude from your what I'm heard now is that we should continue, even though there might be short run cost, to continue to uh, pursue a quotas kind of uh, in hiring practices. Would that be a fair assessment? Well, I, I don't know. I'm sort of with Marianne on this. Um, yeah. And I think quota is very harsh. You can't really impose mm -hmm. that given uh, g given that there's so few. But I think to to be fair, to at least try to seriously consider why why do I rank the male candidate above? If I do that, yeah. am I really looking at the right things? Mm -hmm. Are there reasons to to look at the women in the pool to me to try to make sure that you invite women to to try to evaluate them as fairly as possible? So I would say that's why I say awareness because I think that. Uh, uh, it's different, I think, with the board quota, because then you can say, oh, we already have a man that covers finance, then we can have a woman that mm -hmm. knows uh, digitalization or something else, because uh, you have a, a collection of skills. But m more directly in academia, I, d I don't believe in qu that we okay. could recruit yeah. based on quotas. Yeah, I, I mentioned quotas, but what I really mean, and which I think is very, very prevalent, is that we do an all-female search, for example. I would consider that a quota, that you say, okay, we're not considering men before we hire a woman, which was what you also said, no, what happened? You got an additional uh, position or a part position if you hire a man, uh, a female. But right. actually, the f despite the fact that we get 1.2 position for every woman we hire, it doesn't tilt the decision. So maybe it should, but it doesn't. Are you saying incentives don't work? <laughs> <laughs> maybe if they gave us two positions. Two <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but to come back to what Charlotte said, so I, I really think, so, so I'm still interested in if, if this push, I understand what you're saying, that, I mean, pushing for women just in a blind, like a really rough way to do it, like ignoring all kind of more nuanced uh, reasoning uh, among your faculty, might not really cut it, no? If we want to, if you now look at the, the trends, would, would do you think this awareness would fix it or should we really for uh, yeah go for more harsh measures no in order to get this this um, critical mass of women basically. well if you look at stem uh, to my knowledge it's not that they've had quotas i think they really focused on the gender imbalance i don't think that finance and economics have done that until at least finance i can't speak for economics but until even even if I, it's hardly done even now. I mean, it's just now that the light is coming, coming on this issue. So, uh, so there, I'm hopeful that maybe it's it's not going to fix everything, but I do think it could make a difference. But I think also maybe um, I think these are complicated issues, and maybe it really depends on the department, right? Mm. I mean, maybe some departments just are like locked into a bad culture, and they need a push. Right, and then other departments are reasonable, and people sit down and they they can figure out. They say, okay, yeah, you know, let's think about these issues a bit more, and maybe there you don't need it, right? So, so maybe you know, like with quotas, right? Should should everyone have to have forty percent women, right? Maybe some firms really need that, but some firms, you know, so maybe it's um. Of course, then it's like, how do you have a clear policy? Design no, I mean, my, my no, I, di I didn't want to say that I'm going to now propose a policy that everyone can implement. <laughs> no, I was just curious after the discussion if we, we should conclude that we should let go of this, um, yeah, really promoting women in the, uh, like explicitly, like we're going to do an all women search, basically. So, so slightly from the side, I think that we're all competing for students in the long run. And and I that's why I also think diversity is important because if if you if you envision a school that uh, maintains a really old-fashioned type of faculty that's homogenous that's white male growing older and you have another school that has a much more diverse and younger faculty I think in the long run it's going to be costly not to adapt and I think that must be a driver too. But of course, it's a it's an intriguing thought to have only a female search. So, in all honesty, if the dean told us that we give you your department a position, but you have to hire a woman, of course we'd find a woman. 
Yeah, but okay, yeah. so I know of departments <laughs> who have all female searches and then they fail to hire. Mm -hmm. And that is just like so insulting, <laughs> right? It's just like, okay, you did an all female search and you couldn't find one single woman to hire. I mean, it's just like, it's like staggering. But right? sometimes <laughs> we fail to hire <laughs> even in a mixed search. Isn't that even more embarrassing? Yeah, no, I know. So. Okay, so, so let's wrap, wrap things up. I think we got a lot of new ideas maybe for best practices. And and those might, I mean, obviously they are tougher to summa summarize than having one uh, clear cut policy. So what I will do, we will write after this conference, we will uh, produce a document wi which summarize all the good practices that we've now heard. And then, uh, yeah, we try to distribute. And as we know, it's tough to uh, get people to adopt best practices. So I hope everyone in the audience can contribute to the implementation of the good practices. So thank you very much.